Far too often, treatments and policies are developed to address cancer, not the people living with cancer. Friends knows that centering patients, their needs, and their quality of life can inform better research and change the trajectory of science. We're looking to the future of cancer care, bringing patients and their advocates to the table, making them partners in leading the charge. Our work, advocacy, and expertise is driving groundbreaking legislation that gets patients the treatments and care they urgently need faster than ever. Clinical trials historically have been restricted to a small number of patients. We're broadening eligibility criteria in cancer clinical trials to make them more accessible and equitable. Diagnostic testing can be inconsistent and variable. We've brought all players to the table to make sure tests are accurate so that personalized medicine can truly be precise. Too little information was being used from real-world patient experience to inform treatments. We're creating a new paradigm to shape how therapies are developed. And now we're charting a path for the next generation of breakthroughs. Breakthroughs like our CT Monitor project is one of the largest scale scientific endeavors in Friends history to assess the ability of a rapid and easy to use blood test to monitor treatment response. We're setting the standard for a new biomarker for use in immunotherapy, which will support informed decision making for patients. We are transforming lives and we'll use these 25 years of momentum to drive even more life-changing breakthroughs for years to come. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Siegel, Chair and Founder of Friends of Cancer Research. Thank you for joining us today for this critical conversation on early detection. Every single day, patients are diagnosed with cancers that we know could be more effectively treated if detected earlier. It's time to shift cancer outcomes and multi-cancer early detection tests have the potential to do just that. This is going to require new strategies, evaluating and implementing testing to improving the latest technology. This is a complex topic and we recognize the event is just the start of the conversation. We hope today revamps ongoing conversations and ultimately fulfill our collective goal to positively impact patients. That's why we're here and that's what we all care about. This forum features a new report describing recommended strategies and policy considerations. We are incredibly grateful to have with us the champion of early detection and advocate for patients in science. NCI Director, Dr. Ned Sharpless. I'm honored to turn things over to Ned. Thanks, Ellen, and, and thanks to Friends of Cancer Research for hosting this important meeting. So over the last 50 years, through basic science, we've unlocked many of the mysteries of cancer biology. And over the last 30 years, we've made remarkable progress against cancer mortality. And over the last 10 years in particular, we've seen a boom in cancer treatments and technologies and unprecedented access to cancer data, and now we have researchers working together in new ways and at scales that were really previously unimaginable. So everything in cancer research is moving so much faster so that now we are truly in a, what I consider a golden age of possibility in terms of cancer research and what we can hope to achieve. Of course, though, the hard truth remains that in the United States, we still have 600,000 American di Americans dying every year of cancer. And we may never eradicate cancer for all people but we can continue to reduce the number of people who die from cancer and we can change the national experience of cancer. And I believe we will achieve the goal of the president. The, the president has set forth to cut cancer mortality in half over the next 25 years. But beyond cancer mortality, there are many other ways that we know cancer as a nation. For example, it's currently true that we have too few ways to prevent cancer and that we have many treatments for cancer that are, that are toxic and intolerable and that can cause lifelong morbidity challenges. And there remain stark inequities in cancer diagnosis, treatment, and trial access, and in, in, in patient outcomes. And these inequities are caused by race and region and access to care and resources. And we simply can't end cancer as we know it if we don't reduce the cancer's burden for all populations and eliminate these disparities. In February, President Biden laid out a vision to supercharge the cancer moonshot, that is to build on the strong foundation of the cancer moonshot started in 2016 that the NCI has led, and to go forward from that. The president emphasized the importance of finding cancer early enough to treat it so that we can make a big difference in the experience of cancer. 
The truth is we still find many cancers when it's too late and, when the, and we lack the ability to find them sooner. And this is an especially poignant fact given the estimates that we missed up to 10 million screening events during the pandemic. And this will have implications on cancer outcomes for years to come. Even before the pandemic, people were not getting screened at the levels they should have been. One area where we see tremendous potential to overcome some of these challenges and to find cancer sooner is through multi-cancer early detection tests or MSEDs. We think these are exciting technologies and could really have an important impact on cancer detection and cancer outcomes at the population level if applied robustly. But we also have concerns that MSEDs could lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment if they were implied incorrectly. Just because we treat a cancer early doesn't mean that that's always the best course of action for how to treat that cancer. And that can really be hard for someone who's just found out that they have cancer to, to understand why we uh, want to watch some cancers or, or, or consider the possibility of indolent cancers. Therefore, the NCI strongly feels that we need the right clinical trials to really understand the benefits and also the risks of these new technologies. The White House announced that federal agencies led by the NCI will develop a focused program to expeditiously study and evaluate MSEDs. And the NCI is currently designing clinical trials of MSEDs. We have many uh, research opportunities planned in this initiative and we recently, in this area, and we recently issued a report of information from, de from developers on their readiness for participation in these initiatives. And as today's discussion will show, many questions remain with regard to the regulatory pathways for these tests. It is vital that we talk through these challenges and next steps for MSEDs now to get there. The panelists gathered to speak today bring a range of perspectives that are important to these questions, and I'm excited to hear them all. So I want to thank friends for hosting this important meeting, and I want to thank all of you participating, and let's uh, welcome you all to a great discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sharpless, for joining today's meeting and getting us started. As noted, there is great potential value of MSED screening tests for patients, but also the need for clinical studies to robustly characterize performance and outcomes before implementation of the technology. This was the case for already established success of cancer screening, early detection, and early treatment for selected malignancies. MSEDs bring additional complexities and logistical obstacles for the use of gold standard prospective randomized clinical trials, but it presents the opportunity to explore innovative strategies for generating and assessing evidence to sufficiently characterize the safety and effectiveness of these screening tests that can identify the presence of various cancers. Over the past several months, we've been working with a multi-stakeholder group of experts in the field to construct the white paper that was distributed in advance of today's meeting. The group focused on identifying opportunities to generate meaningful real-world evidence, which we've defined as information derived during the course of usual patient care, Specifically, the group explored ways to supplement evidence for regulatory decision-making for MSED screening tests, while also considering opportunities for data collection to create a continuum of evidence generation. We recognize this is a complex topic with many viewpoints, but we hope to highlight where there's alignment to continue to move the field forward. To lead the first panel discussion and to discuss the opportunities and considerations for the use of real-world data, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dan Hayes from the University of Michigan Rogel Cancer Center. Dan? I've only been on Zooms a million times the last two years. I think I know how to unmute myself. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate uh, the introduction and I'm, I'm really pleased and honored to chair this first panel in which uh, we'll try to review our discussions over the last several months regarding the types of data, especially real world data, as Jeff described it, to introduce a, a, any screening test, but especially MSEDs uh, into clinical use and, and to help us who are clinicians figure out how to use these things accurately and reliably and safely. Uh, before we start, what I'd like to do is just briefly introduce the people on this panel um, uh, in addition to myself, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Uh, Ruth Etzioni, a biostatistician and epidemiologist and professor of biostatistics of uh, the Public Health Division at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center Research Center in Seattle. Dr. Garish Putcha, who is a, a clinical and molecular genetic pathologist uh, and is the senior vice president uh, for reimbursement strategy at Freenome. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Sam, or Mr. Sam Roos, sorry, I just promoted you, Sam, 
uh, Mr. Sam Roos, who's the uh, NMBA, and he's the CEO and co-founder of Crescendo Health. Dr. Wendy Rubenstein, who is a physician and uh, head of personalized medicine, the deputy office of director at the US FDA in the Centers for Device and uh, Radiologic Health. And uh, Ms. Seema Singh Ban, uh, who is head of public policy and external affairs at Exact Sciences Corporation. So uh, uh, welcome to all of you and thank you for taking part in this. Before we go on, I'd like to expand just briefly on what Dr. Sharpless described. And, and fundamentally, having thought about this for a long, long time with two biomarkers um, and working with a really talented woman named Mike Ladina, a PhD, which we tried to set up, how do you evaluate the value of tumor biomarkers in general? She came up with some two interesting terms. One was opt-in. If the standard of care is not to do something and the test tells you you should, you opt in to do it. And that's mostly what Dr. Sharpless was talking about with the caveats of overdiagnosis, of false positives, technical false positives, and so on. The other is to opt out. And that is if the standard of care is to do something. As Dr. Sharpless already mentioned, uh, as did Jeff, we have a number of screening tests already that we know uh, save lives, improve survival from cancer. And if the test tells you you shouldn't get it, then they're opting out. Both of those are two sides of the same coin but are very important to keep in mind as we go forward and discuss how we might use real world evidence to help us either opt in when the standard of care is not to do anything or to opt out if the standard of care is to do something and you can safely say, I don't need to do that. So having said that, we have a number of questions that we've raised and I'd like to call on the panel members uh, to discuss each one of them. The first is I'd like to call on Dr. Rubenstein to talk about <clears throat> why it's important to align on study designs and evidentiary needs for assessment of MCED screening tests now. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein, can you briefly describe the FDA's perception at present regarding MCEDs uh, and perhaps even uh, discuss the workshop that you uh, ran in 2020 at the FDA? By the way, the last official meeting I attended in the last two years <laughs> because of COVID. Same here. I think that was the last meeting I was at physically, and uh, even then it was probably a little bit too deep into the pandemic. It was a narrowed um, uh, invitation. Um, I'd like to, to thank Friends for setting this up today and, um, and point out that the working group and Friends have, have really done some careful thinking about real-world data and how it can be used to support regulatory decision-making. Um, as you pointed out, uh, FDA held a public workshop in March of 2020. And I also want to mention the work that NCI's MSED trial team has been doing. And that's helped us to um, have an emerging understanding about the key assessment questions that are needed to evaluate um, performance characteristics, safety, and clinical outcomes. And we can anticipate that in the short term, test developers will bring their technology to FDA for pre-market evaluation. And that prospective clinical studies possibly supplemented by real world evidence will support initial approvals for cancers. And that'll be with say the top five to 10 highest incidence rate cancers. Um, but you know, patients are susceptible to a long tail of cancers that won't be in the intent, initial intended use. And those cancers will show up as possible signals. So what should their doctors advise? Now, um, you know, many clinicians will bring their patients through diagnostic workups where the evidence at that point is thin at best. And we don't know um, necessarily, are these patients benefited or not? Um, if we haven't placed ourselves in a position now to address these questions later, then I, I don't think the technology will have been rolled out into practice as well as it should be, especially given what a transformation this could bring to cancer screening. So, so if, for example, the in initial intended use did not include pancreatic cancer, how are we gonna learn whether downstaging is possible for this particular cancer, uh, whether treatment in an earlier stage improves outcomes in this very hard to treat cancer, or whether too many people have complications from an invasive diagnostic workup and even sometimes die from pancreatitis instead of reaping the benefits of early detection. Now, I think it might be okay not to know all of these answers at initial approval if the benefit risk um, assessment is uh, favorable, but 
unless we plan, we won't even know the answers five or 10 years from now. Now, you know, many on this panel could do back of the napkin calculations to show that clinical trials cannot address all these questions in the right time frame for an affordable cost. But if we organize our healthcare data to function as a learning health system, we can aggregate the experiences of patients. And that could mean the data could serve as valid scientific evidence. And we may be able to consider RWE as the primary evidence in, post in the post-market setting for additional indications. And that could be to understand sensitivity for rare cancers and even cancers with moderate incidence rates. Um, RWE could be used as uh, supplemental evidence uh, for patients who are in middle age where the confidence intervals for initial approvals may be fairly wide because of re relatively fewer events. And we could even gain a better understanding of safety on a cancer-specific basis for diagnostic workups where most, most of, the list, uh, of the risk probably lies. So that is a, an approach uh, that the FRIENDS effort can help um, us support to expand this set of indications for authorized tests over time and also maintain authorization where the initial evidence was not as strong. Thank you, Dr. Rubenstein. That was an enormous amount of valuable information in a very short period of time. Uh, Ms. Bond, I'd like to ask you, I mean, one of the issues is what's the difference between an MCED uh, and a single cancer screening test, for example, like PSA, and how do you see those merging together? I mean, what, what's the signal we should be looking for and the diagnostic needs and, and how these differ? Thanks so much, Dan. And thank you, friends, for putting together this forum. I think it's really imperative that we zoom out before we zoom back in on this issue. We know that advancements in the treatment of cancer, such as in immunotherapy and targeted therapies, have been incredible for cancer patients. But the reality is that over 70% of cancers are detected at late stage. And to paraphrase Dr. Bert Vogelstein, no therapy is as effective as earlier detection. And now we're at this inflection point where the focus on early detection of disease has the potential to significantly improve cancer outcomes by intervening at an earlier stage. But the cancer paradigm, as you said, currently revolves around single organ screening tests which targets one organ at a time. Single organ cancer screening is credited with asymptomatic detection of approximately 17% of cancers annually. And today, too many people are diagnosed through symptoms rather than through being screened. So despite the progress made by these exceptional single organ screening innovations, there's still a great unmet need to increase that cancer detection rate because over 70% of cancer deaths occur among cancers that currently do not have recommended screening. And there's no clear pathway for MSET tests. The science and the technology was not in existence when policies around prevention and early detection were made, were made decades ago for cancer screening. And as a result, MSET does not simply fit into the single organ screening network framework. Single organ screening tests are designed to optimize sensitivity. For example, the sensitivity of a mammography is 87%. Specificity or the false positive rate of a mammography is 11%. These false positive rates are much more acceptable in a single organ screening setting than it would be for a multi-cancer setting because when the test is confined to one organ of interest, false positives can be more readily managed um, because we are screening within a single organ. We need to think about multi-cancer testing in a more nuanced manner. For such a test to be successful, the screening for MSEDs need to have a higher specificity, or in other words, a very low false positive rate, because ultimately most people do not have cancer. And if these tests are to be implemented on a population level, um, we need to be cognizant of that. MSET test performance will undoubtedly differ across organ sites because of how the tumor sheds into the bloodstream. And to get the most cancer detection, given that the denominator for sensitivity is multiple cancers, the MSET test must include cancers that may have lower sensitivity. So by contrast to a single organ screening test, 
High specificity or a low false positive rate is the key performance of an MSET test. As a test designed for an average risk population, it is not desirable to have a high rate of false positives, as this will heighten concerns about the increased unnecessary diagnostic interventions. So we thank friends for leading this charge and opening up a meaningful conversation. And we look forward to this dialogue. Um, it is essential that industry takes it a responsible and thoughtful approach, and we look forward to leaning in more. So thanks, Dan, for the question. And we look, I look forward to the dialogue. Thank you, Ms. Bond. Dr. Pucha, I have sort of a follow-up question on that. And <clears throat> what are the limitations to using the current screen, screening studies to generate the totality of evidence that's, that's necessary for MCEDs or liquid biopsies? Uh, you know, what are the pros and cons of the current standard of care screening studies and how real-world evidence would complement those? Okay. Thank you, Dan, and thanks again. I'll add my thanks to friends for organizing this forum and facilitating this conversation. So some of the limitations I think, Dan, are fairly obvious, right? So first, the duration of follow-up for interventional studies where the test results are shared with patients and providers, and then patients are managed accordingly can be long and variable given different natural histories for different cancers, right? Second, especially for the less prevalent cancers like say pancreatic or ovarian and so forth, performing such studies in the intended use population can require tens if not hundreds of thousands of patients. And then finally, as we know, registrational clinical trials are carefully controlled and so generally do not reflect real world medical practice. Um, and one example that applies here is that adherence to screening can be quite different in the real world. And as many have shown, this can have very, a very significant impact on the clinical utility of such tests. Now, all of these challenges can be addressed or at least mitigated through the use of real world data, which of course has its own pros and cons, which I know we'll be discussing next. So thanks again for the opportunity and thanks to friends. Thank you very much. I wanna add a little bit to Dr. Bond's comments. Mostly she was discussing opting in, finding things that we can't find right now. Another real risk though, is to do MCDs and suddenly have them replacing the standard of care screening and having people opting out and not getting things that we know cure people. So there, again, this is a double-edged sword. You really did a very nice job in my opinion of a very complex answer. Mr. Ruse, I'd like to call on you now about how you think real world data could be incorporated into prospective study designs. Uh, Dr. Rubenstein touched on this for screening tests and, and possible strategies and the things you've thought about the spectrum of where real world data would fall into to place here. Well, uh, thank you, Dan. And, and thank you friends for, for hosting this conversation. Uh, we had a lot of lively discussion and debate within the working group about how even to define real world data for, for this context. Uh, and, and so I'll start there. Of, uh, how, what I would put forward is that when we, we talk about real world data for MSED, uh, studies, really what we're talking about is the clinical data about patients participating in a study that rests outside of the trial site. Uh, and really the, the most powerful thing that real world data offers for these studies is exactly that, the, the opportunity to cast a, a wider net for data capture. Uh, as, as you think about the contrast with the traditional study, we have patients uh, enroll at a, at a given study site and predictably, they'll come back to that site to uh, assess a expanded set of outcomes uh, on a regular basis. But for, for MSET tests, uh, patients might receive the screening at one institution, but the possible future institutions where the patient might be subsequently diagnosed and managed for a, for a cancer uh, can be uh, enumerated in, in hundreds or even thousands of different, different locations. And so the, the fundamental challenge is how do we, how do we detect a uh, given that these patients can subsequently be cared for in such a diverse set of, of settings? Uh, how do we reliably detect, uh, has the patient been diagnosed with cancer? How do we define whether a true negative is really a true negative without the insight into uh, uh, the patient's uh, broader journey of care? And how do we understand how that patient has been staged and, uh, and managed with that cancer to both understand the clinical utility of that early detection, 
uh, and get the context that we need to effectively adjudicate outcomes for the study. Uh, and so that's uh, exactly the promise that, that real world data offers. Uh, we gained the opportunity with a lot of the, the recent advancements of uh, interoperability and data liquidity to be able to uh, blend together the best of both worlds of using traditional methods of data capture, the EDC, EPRO, uh, in the locations where uh, we can have folks come back into study sites and receive those gold standard screenings where they exist. Um, but also be able to complement that with the much broader view and perspective of that patient's journey beyond the, the site in which they were enrolled and managed to be able to understand uh, what is happening beyond and ensure that where we determine that something is a true negative, it truly is a, a, a negative. Uh, and to also be able to uh, get that insight that Garish was speaking about of the uh, longitudinal follow-up of these patients and to be able to see how that uh, potential for early detection manifests in better outcomes for patients over time. Uh, so you. tremendously excited to uh, have this conversation about innovative methods and uh, looking forward to the, the, the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Roos. He discussed, we did have very robust discussions. I guarantee everyone that no one was slapped as a part of our discussion. So. <laughs> uh, Dr. Etzioni, you're probably one of the world's experts on designing prospective trials and evaluating uh, epidemiologic data regarding screening. So I really have two questions for you. Uh, and they're really, you know, can you briefly discuss the gold standard approach to demonstrating screening for malignancies has clinical utility? And then the pitfalls of real world evidence, but also the strengths that they might bring into this in terms of, for example, endpoints and what we're looking for. You're muted. There you go. Thank you, Dan. Um, it's always hard when someone says two questions because you get so engaged in the first. I might have to ask you to remind me about the second. <laughs> um, in terms of gold standard evaluation, there really is a mantra. The mantra goes like this, randomized clinical uh, trials, screening trials, um, with disease specific mortality as the endpoint. And of course, the reason for this is that the randomized trial is going to avoid the selection issues that you inevitably have in the observational setting. And I think it's really important to uh, consider this because in the observational setting, you do not only have a selection into screening, it's not only that those patients who elect to receive screening or who are able to receive screening are different from those who don't. But what happens afterwards? Because remember that screening can only be beneficial as part of a continuum of care. You have to have proper follow-up and you have to have appropriate treatment. And those um, individuals who are able to receive screening or elect to receive screening may be very different all the way along that continuum of care. And by the way, this can also be a problem in trials because patients, um, trials do not always control the treatment that happens after the diagnosis and trials need to show that on the different arms of the trials, treatment was comparable. So the randomized trial is to avoid those selection problems. And the disease-specific mortality is that this is the most unbiased um, endpoint for benefit. Uh, we, um, mortality particularly measured, it's really the, it's the survival from the start of the trial. In both screened and unscreened groups, survival is measured from the same point. If you measure survival from diagnosis, you're actually measuring survival from a different point in the screened and the unscreened group. You could have a screening test that detects patients a year earlier, but doesn't change their, um, survive, their, their life expectancy and it would look like survival would be different between the two groups. And this is an issue in the real world data as well, where um, the real world data is not only subject to the issues of comparison, of comparability, but also these endpoints. And um, several endpoints have been uh, put forward in the paper as uh, surrogate endpoints. I'll just talk about one very briefly, um, which has been talked about a lot. And there's a new article uh, coming out in uh, CDP or it's just online that is again advancing the idea of um, um, late stage incidence as a surrogate for mortality. And uh, we have to rec recognize that this is uh, definitely going to be an imperfect surrogate. Uh, and um, if we look back at the screening trials that we have conducted, we find that the reduction in late stage incidence does not predict the observed reduction in mortality across trials. So we have some work to do here, but it's certainly um, on, on the path. And um, there are, uh, in the paper, um, we've been very careful to talk about the limitations of these different endpoints, including the surrogate. 
Ruth, just very briefly, can you uh, talk about ways that as an epidemiologist, you can adjust real world evidence to get rid of some of the lead time bias and that sort of thing? Um, right. What, one um, minute. There's a lot of adjustments. Yes, 30 seconds. I would want to say that the um, that the uh, statistical community has really stepped up and, there's, um, and, and the health economics communities have come together and really um, developed uh, uh, an entire suite in the comparative effectiveness space of methods that can be used to deal with the selection factors. Um, as far as the lead time factor, that is very difficult to account for in observational studies. And that's why I'm personally not a, 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 a proponent of using survival in the real world space as a surrogate. Thank you very much. Um, we're gonna skip on to the a final question and that is looking to the future. And, and really that is what are the next steps that we need to do to use real world data to help us decide how to, to employ screening tests into our practices. And Dr. Rubenstein, I'll let you go first. You already sort of told us, but what's the FDA looking for in this situation? Sure, um, thank you. Well, I think we can take a, a page out of the book that Friends has, has done uh, with FDA's Oncology Center of Excellence involving about 10 uh, real-world data partners to develop a common collaborative research protocol. In that case, it was for pdl one therapies. Uh, you know, we know that most, uh, very few healthcare systems have invested deeply enough in their IT systems to pr produce fit-for-purpose RWD that could possibly be used for regulatory purposes. Um, but data aggregators have been tackling interoperability and um, addressing data relevance and reliability, they could uh, possibly be engaged in IVD evaluations. So we can plan ahead, um, plan ahead to support harmonized data collection and standards, um, develop common methodological frameworks, rely on key variable definitions uh, to leverage RWD that comes uh, through usual care. And it's really not too early to plan for the use of RWD in regulatory decision-making for MSEDs. Um, CDRH has a deep experience with RWD for um, devices during the life cycle and um, has a growing experience with IVDs, including COVID diagnostics. And we're very interested in continuing to engage with stakeholders. I don't speak for the FDA, but many times I finish my lectures by saying that luck is not a good strategy for golf or fishing or science. It's good to have when you get it, and it's good to see it. But uh, what Dr. Rubenstein just told us is plan ahead and, and be strategic about it. So uh, very nice. Uh, Ms. Roos, do you have any ideas about, uh, from a company standpoint, the, you know, the next steps for robust real world data? How do you plan to capture these? Uh, so I'll be brief here. Right? I think Mr. That, Roos, uh, sorry, sorry, I was looking at the wrong one. Mr. No problem. I, uh, we have to, uh, continue the efforts to uh, expand on uh, tools for interoperability and increase the liquidity of data in the ecosystem to make the, these, these data accessible for researchers. Uh, we also need to do the work to define and validate um, the measures that we're going to use from the real world data and confirm that uh, we're going to be able to get a uh, strong signal um, and uh, handle the messiness that's inherent in these data sets as we bring it into regulatory context. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pocha, do you have anything to add to that in terms of, uh, again, we're looking for company interactions with collaborations. Where do you see this going? You're muted, Dr. Pocha. Yeah, um, sorry, Dan. I, I think what I, I guess to try to be really brief, right? I think one of the things that we really think about is how far down this continuum of clinical validity versus clinical utility we need to actually go for regulatory authorizations, right? Because we've actually gone back and looked, you know, since 2000 at FDA authorizations for screening tests, and in gen, and you know, uh, there's not a single one that actually requires an interventional study designed for pre-market approval. So as we think about this, I think, you know, which, um, how far down that continuum of validity versus utility do we need to go? Which surrogate endpoints will be acceptable, and which can be assessed with appropriate rigor using real-world data or modeling? as opposed to more conventional clinical studies. I think those are gonna be some topics for us to cover. Great, and Ms. Bond, you get the final 30 seconds. Sure, thank you. Um, number one, the potential of MSED tests will be fully realized when they live in complement with current standard of care screening. 
But secondly, and more importantly, the promise of these great new technologies tests will not be realized unless we continue to change the way we think about how we diagnose and track cancer based on our ever expanding knowledge of cancer biology. And that will be done in collaboration with um, all key parties. And this is what Friends has done here, putting us all together so we can think forge a path forward. I think collaboration is key. This is not about one company or one test. It's about a future where everyone can get a reliable early diagnosis and have a better chance at survival. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the panel members for A, being so expert in what you do and B, being so short in how you get it across. I refer everyone to the white paper, which has been distributed. Uh, as Brittany told us, and now I turn it back over to Jeff Allen for panel two. Jeff? Jeff, you're muted. Thanks very much, Dan, and to all the panelists. I want to sincerely thank the entire working group for their time and expertise in developing the white paper that you've received today. As we look ahead to the potential implications of MSEDS, our next panel will provide insights into how these early detection tests may alter the future of drug development. To lead our discussion today, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Ernie Hawk at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Ernie. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jeff. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing my uh, colleagues here. Um, first up, we will uh, be hearing from five individuals. First of all, uh, Ms. Nicole Dresner from the US FDA. Uh, Dr. Dresner, thank you for joining us. Second, Dina Gifkins from Johnson & Johnson to bring a pharmaceutical uh, perspective to the discussion. Third, uh, Ms. Judy Hoyos from the Prevent Cancer Foundation, a prominent prevention advocacy organization that's really led the charge in uh, cancer prevention across our country. Josh Offman joins us from, uh, from a biotech or diagnostics company perspective. Um, he works at Grail. And then finally, um, Dr. Nick Papadopoulos from Johns Hopkins University will bring an academic perspective to today's discussion. And just as um, Jeff introduced, um, the, uh, the topic for our consideration here over the next uh, 20 minutes or so are the near and long-term implications of MSED screening tests on the delivery of cancer care, as well as the future of oncology drug development um, with its implications for study design, regulatory decision-making, et cetera. Now this comes in the context, just as we heard, of a technology that could very well revolutionize our approach to cancer detection by finding more cancers and um, finding them much earlier. Already um, in 2022, from my perspective um, in cancer prevention at MD Anderson, the best data suggests that a third to a half of cancers that occur in the United States and other Western populations are in theory preventable, but realizing that promise is part of the challenge. And so today's discussion will discuss the opportunities presented by MSEDS, the implications of them for drug development. And then finally, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists regarding how we realize the promise um, through the uh, series of studies that will be, um, that will be uh, entertained. So to begin today, let's just talk a little bit about the opportunities for early interception that MSEDS offer. Earlier cancer identification and interception may um, be the result of the application of these tests in the real world, just as panel one has reminded us. How might MSED testing influence our approach to interventions thereafter? And I'm going to ask both Judy as well as Nick to uh, make some introductory comments in this regard. Uh, Jody, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Hawk. I'm happy to start this. I, you know, when we're thinking about the potential for early interception, and I'm using that term in the broad sense, um, we can and should be thinking about the opportunity to optimize the multi-cancer early detection test encounter. You've heard that referred to as MSED. You've heard that referred to as MCED today, but multi-cancer early detection tests, how can we use that encounter to incorporate discussions and information about lifestyle uh, in, into that visit and into that information. Uh, we know there's tremendous potential for um, influencing disease progression and disease occurrence when we have that information and discussions and it's just simply not happening now. 
So that's where I would begin with the opportunity. Thank you. So they may very well inform the sorts of uh, behavioral and lifestyle interventions that we recommend to patients. So thank you for highlighting that. <clears throat> Nick, I'd next like to ask you, what are the implications um, of the promise, as we've heard, for finding cancers earlier, perhaps um, with, uh, with a greater array of therapeutic options? Yeah, uh, first, uh, thanks for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel and thanks to the friends for all of the work they're doing, especially bringing all of us together from different perspectives to try to, you know, manage this, uh, this issue, which is important, but uh, still, you know, it's um, early stages, I, I think. Um, so the MSEDs or whatever we're going to call them, they, they are a test that we were developing for screening for, for identifying screen detected cancers, as um, uh, uh, Dr. Sarpolis and other people mentioned, this opens the opportunity or the window to manage individuals at the stage of the cancer that hopefully we can actually um, increase survival or even treat individuals with intent to cure. Um, so improvement of uh, patients, uh, of patient outcomes comes with management. And that is what is going to intervene with the progression of cancer or interfere with the progression of cancer. So I, I will, before we put, I think the, the horse, whatever, uh, the, what is this, the cart before the horse, I think we need to really evaluate those uh, tests at the, um, not observational trials, uh, as uh, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, but in prospective trials with interventional trials. And the reason for that is, and I think is important, is first, when you have prospective trial, you're looking for individuals that they do not know that they have cancer, that they do not know that they have, that they do not have signs for cancer, but yet this, this test that we develop and detects them. Usually those cancers are earlier stage and they are smaller. So they are different than the cancers that actually we test developers use to develop those tests because already, you know, we needed to have case control studies with already detected cancer. So that is one important, um, uh, I think, point of setting up this type of trials. Trials An intervention, which is part of testing how this odyssey of these individuals will be, not only for safety, but also to try to see risk and benefit uh, effects. It, it needs to be uh, evaluated very carefully before those tests go out and used in the public. I know that, and I'm not gonna bring it up, um, there are a lot of discussions, what will be the endpoints uh, uh, of these uh, trials, uh, you know, so they won't take 20, 30 years. And I think, you know, in the white paper, there are good suggestions for that. And I think the real world evidence could supplement, not um, replace these uh, this, uh, studies. So when we talk also how to use this uh, for intervention, assuming that we have good sensitivity for early detection, there will be more cancers detected and, uh, and provides the opportunity to test even new therapeutics in cancers of this uh, you know, early stage that we couldn't really do it before, at least we couldn't do it in, in uh, larger numbers. But we need to also be careful with the information that the, the MSEDs provide. Those, this information, it depends to what the therapy is. If we're looking, I think with early detection, if it's successful, perhaps we're going to increase surgeries because now the cancers are detected earlier and they can be removed. Uh, that is a good setting to test that this test can help. However, if you're looking for uh, to, to set up a trial for a rare cancer uh, that uh, this trial is for a therapeutic, therapeutic that requires, let's say, a companion diagnostics, not all those tests would actually provide this information. So we need to put it in, in a context of what information these tests provide, what is the target population for this test, uh, is it a early detection for um, and symptomatic individuals or high risk individuals, and how this uh, fits? I, I don't. I don't want to be negative, in, but in, it, we have to take those things into account as we say that we're going to help the development of of drug. 
Last very brief point, this test will detect also later cancers. That, that, that is the part of uh, the game. Uh, we're going to detect stage three and sometimes stage four cancers for some reason, they remain undetected. So overall, we have to validate those tests in prospect, in my view, prospective interventional trials. And yes, it's going to give us the opportunity to test and, and evaluate the efficacy of new therapeutics. And I'll stop here in the interest of time. I'm, maybe I'll make comments later. Thank you, Nick. Um, now I'd like to turn to some of the implications for MSED um, screening on drug development. Um, Dr. Gifkins, I wonder if you can um, explore that issue for us a bit. What do you feel the implications may be for of finding cancers earlier in the uh, in the drug development process? Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Hawk, and thank you, friends, for inviting me to speak here today and all the work that you're doing. Um, so the main impact of earlier and more specific detection of cancer in the drug development process would um, be mainly enabling additional enrichment strategies into our clinical trials. So if we're able to identify high-risk subgroups for both the prediction of the development of cancer along with interception strategies, as well as prognostic implications for disease severity, this would allow us to select a study population in which the detection of a drug effect is more likely than it would be in an unselected population. So this would increase both logistical and statistical efficiencies in the way of sample size, time to treatment effect, and the magnitude of the treatment effect. Um, it would also support efforts in precision medicine or tailoring of treatments to patients who would most likely benefit from the therapies. So currently we use a number of enrichment strategies to reduce variability in our patient population, including choosing patients that are at high risk or have a greater likelihood of having the selected endpoint. And the introduction of these screening tools would really enhance that capability. So by using and said screening tools earlier in clinical development, we can potentially increase the absolute effect difference between groups using smaller sample size requirements and potentially um, reducing follow-up times, which could potentially speed up the overall drug development process in cancer patient populations. Thank you very much, Dina. Um, Josh, I wonder if you could share your perspective. Sure. Um, thank you for having me and um, great job, friends, for pulling us all together. I think a couple of really important points that have kind of been touched on, but, but maybe not fully uh, understood. First is that, you know, again, we have an opportunity to dramatically increase the cancer detection rate in the population. And obviously, when you go through the population the first time, you're going to find late stage and early stage cancers. But as we get into the incident screens, we're going to find much more early stage cancers. Drug developers are incredibly interested in that for the application of neoadjuvant strategies, adjuvant strategies, and the application of to have a much better effect size as you treat early cancer. But I often get asked, you know, don't, don't most of these early rare cancers have no available treatments? That's just absolutely not the case. We have to remember that most early localized cancers, solid tumors, are treated surgically. And so um, the use, they almost all have treatments with the exception of thyroid and prostate, where you might watch and wait, every other solid cancer um, is potentially curable with surgical and sometimes radiation therapy. So the opportunity now to identify earlier cancers and use neoadjuvant and adjuvant strategies to further improve outcomes is really dramatic. And the last thing I'll say is we are on, you know, looking at these MSED technologies, which look at circulating tumor DNA we're actually rewriting the textbook of cancer biology as we're developing the tests. So we know that there's within a stage of a solid cancer, there's a wide distribution of outcomes. And we, we know that um, the amount of DNA that's shed from these tumors is likely as prognostic uh, for survival or for mortality as stages. And so, you know, this is gonna create new opportunities for drug developers to begin to think about how to get a prognostic element into their trials that stage has yet to fully be able to provide. And so I think that's going to be a huge advantage for drug developers going forward. Thanks, Josh. It really, really does have the potential to redefine um, how we think of the word, actually, and, and its implications for patients. Nicole, I wonder if you'd like to contribute to the conversation in terms of the, the potential impact on uh, drug development. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks, um, Dr. Hawk, and thank you, uh, friends, for having me on the panel. 
Um, so I think as we've been saying that uh, there's one major potential benefit of MSEDs um, in detecting earlier stage disease when it's more readily treatable. But when the standard of care therapy is observation, for example, after a potentially curative intervention such as surgery in patients with earlier stage disease, there may be a lower tolerance um, for patients and their providers to, rel to rely upon the results of an MSED to initiate a therapy, particularly given the significant toxicities of most anti-cancer therapies that we have today. Um, one mitigating factor I think that could potentially balance these benefits and risks may be, may be in the clinical trial setting to incorporate only biomarker positive patients who are known to have a higher risk of development of metastatic disease into prospective clinical trials um, that are evaluating patients with earlier stage disease. Um, in patients with later stage disease, MSIDs can be used to be monitoring patients during treatment, both for the development of resistance mutations, which can, be, which can provide a benefit um, by triggering a, an earlier change in therapy, um, as well as for response to therapy in which a patient's treatment can be maintained if the results of MSED testing reflect an improvement in tumor, board, in tumor burden that may not be able to be observed on imaging. Um, AEs in that scenario or adverse events may be more tolerable to the patient um, if they are receiving if, or if they know they are receiving a therapy that either um, targets a specific resistance mutation that has developed um, or if there is evidence of tumor regression on their current therapy. Um, that may not be observable on imaging. So um, I think there are a lot of ways in both the early stage and later stage disease in which risks um, uh, can be balanced um, for the use of MSEDs. Thank you very much, uh, Nicole. And now we have about uh, five minutes remaining. So I'm gonna ask um, for each of our panelists to contribute a quick response to um, the following question. And that is, we've talked a little bit about the opportunity and the potential implications on clinical trials. I'd like you to think now about priorities and um, tell us your perspective on what's needed to try to realize the promise of NSAIDs uh, in the near term. Nicole, we'll start with you. Um, so I think that uh, a priority, at least from the regulatory standard, is um, the development of trial designs that build um, MSEDs into various stages of the trial, um, either before neoadjuvant uh, therapy, after neoadjuvant therapy, um, stratifies patients by marker positive versus marker negative, um, and is done in sort of a standardized way across the, the, patient, um, the, the patient population. And, and these should be sort of large scale prospective therapies. So I think from a, a CEDAR regulatory perspective, um, that, that is important going forward and something that we, um, that we like to talk about with drug developers early on in development. Thank you, Nicole, and appreciate your attendance to uh, being brief. <laughs> uh, next <laughs> up, Josh, perhaps you could share your perspective on the promise, what's needed to realize the promise. Yeah, I think, I think we've talked in both panels about the enormous promise of going from finding 15% of incident cancers now in a screen detected way to potentially getting to 50% and maybe even 75% of those deadliest cancers. So enormous opportunity. The first part, um, the highest priority is making sure we have a pathway um, to get these products approved and into the market for early detection that doesn't take decades um, uh, to wait for these, you know, kind of hard, um, you know, traditional endpoints. And we need a regulatory pathway that allows us to understand what this technology is doing, which is often finding a common cancer signal in the blood and then localizing those signals to different parts of the body. And that's just a, a very different framework we need to develop. So that's the highest priority. And then once that's done, we can then do um, I think what Nicole said is we need to then begin to use that technology in the drug development space with properly conducted trials, looking at biomarkers as both prognostic markers, as being able to detect minimal residual disease and to detect early recurrence. And those require very specific um, and different trial designs. But the first priority is just getting these products um, you know, well-validated clinically and on the, on the way to measuring clinical utility using a variety of different approaches so that, you know, we're not waiting, you know, decades. By that time, the technology will be obsolete. Thanks, Josh. And that, that certainly is the intent, I think, behind the Friends of Cancer, um, convening all of us to have these kinds of discussions that involve government as well as patient perspectives, academics, uh, as well as industry. 
Um, Dina, I'm going to give you a shot at the same question. What do you consider to be the priority for realizing the promise of these tests? Sure. I think, um, you know, from my standpoint as an epidemiologist, if we can utilize these tests to be able to build them into predictive models to better understand high-risk subgroups, um, as I mentioned earlier, the efficiencies that we would gain in our uh, trial development, as well as, um, you know, just being able to um, supplement within our clinical trials in terms of eligibility criteria. Um, if we can use this information to target geographic areas or clusters in which these tests are used widely, or we have patients that are at highest risk, um, particularly in areas where there is no standard of care existing, um, if we can use real world data to combine the results of these screening tools to develop multifactorial profiles um, that also include things like patient disease state and other patient factors. If we can identify patients that are at the highest risk, um, we can certainly continue to work towards that goal of reducing um, inefficiencies in, in clinical trial design. Thank you very much, Dina. Nick, um, here's an opportunity, a minute. Gail, what do you think the priority should be? Yeah, I, I I still think the priority, as um, Joshua said, we need to validate those tests. Um, it, my view is, uh, again, as I said earlier, it's uh, in prospective interventional trials, which also they're going to give us uh, information about what happens to the individuals. Um, and then uh, uh, we have to think that they're not going to fit every single of the clinical applications. We have to make decisions there. And then uh, finally, I, I agree with Nicole to how, you know, once those things work uh, to, to have uh, carefully designed um, trials uh, for, for drug development. Thank you, Nick. And Jody, I'll give you the, the final uh, input into this critical issue of which should be our priorities to realize the potential of these technologies. Oh, excellent. Thank you. And not surprisingly, um, in addition to what everyone else has mentioned, my perspective is that the priority is on the people. And the priority would be an acceptance of these tests by the people who would be using them, particularly those people who are eligible for the current standards of care in screening, but are either not able to use them or not willing to use them. That's where I would rank as number one. Thank you, Jody. Uh, bringing the patient and the public, in this case, um, uh, insights into this discussion is so critical. And uh, thank you for reminding us of that. I'd like to close this session and pass it uh, back to my colleagues from, um, from uh, the, the organization. I'd, I'd like to, in particular, thank the Friends of Cancer Research for um, their efforts to advance our conversation around the potential uses and applications of these tests as this technology comes forward. Jeff, back to you. Thanks, Ernie, and thanks to the panel for sharing their insights today. While I know there's a lot packed into an hour here, I hope it's we've, that we've been able to identify some of the challenges and the transformative opportunities as we forge a path ahead for the future of MSED testing. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Please keep an eye out for additional upcoming Friends events. And in the meantime, stay well. Thank you.